on board in our near space powered by near we are about ready to start our journey with our speakers uh, we have web3 community day a lot of great speakers and after that for sure we are going to enjoy happy hours upstairs with some uh, drinks uh, thank you so much everyone who's joined our live broadcast so uh, I think it's time to start. I'm happy to present you our first speaker, Ilya Palasukhin, co-founder NIR, and Ilya will tell us uh, about involving ecosystem governance. Welcome, Ilya. Hello, hello, everyone. Hope you're having a good day. It's way cooler than it was on Monday, which is great. Uh, we're still shaking, which is OK. Um, depends how much you drank yesterday. So uh, I would like to talk about the governance. So near mission is kind of world where people have control of their assets, data, and power of governance. And you know everybody knows about control of money and assets. You know Bitcoin introduced this kind of uh, idea. We've been doing a lot on the data. You know we've talked to social. We're talking about kind of uh, more broadly NFTs, creators, all of those parts. But the power of governance have been, you know, a kind of question like, what is this, and how do we actually coordinate large communities, large ecosystems, in such a way that it still it makes progress, it makes decisions, but uh, you know is representative and is able to uh, you know work with our communities. And so, the given the governance is kind of the core part, right? And we, you know, if you look across the ecosystems, across Web3 in general, nobody has figured out a system that truly works, right? Like there's been a lot of experiments, there's been really failed experiments, uh, and there's been things that, you know, work reasonably well. But all of them, you know, one way or another, uh, kind of lack what you usually see in, you know, very successful companies with like kind of execution, growth, etc. And you know, we need to start, and we need to start it in a way that will have an embedded process of refinement, right? Will not be perfect, will never be. That's why, you know, we're always trying to be closer, uh, nearer to it. And so we need to embed meta governance into this process, and we need to review, and we need to set the goals for how this will be. So why do we need this, right? I mean, yes, part of it is our mission. Is this is like it's important, kind of broadly speaking, right? That people have a say in the things they are participating, right? If you are using Facebook, you should have a say in what features they're launching or what features they're unlaunching from you or whatever they change completely everything, right? And and you know, by potentially wiped out your business. And so the Kind of at the same time, if we talk about ecosystems, right, these distributed communities, we end up in a lot of kind of decentralized people and nodes that have different interests, right? And like on a basic level, we have you know proof of stake, proof of work, like some kind of basic economic alignment, but it doesn't scale, and it ends up in bureaucracy, it ends up in politics, it ends up in like I don't know who's responsible for blah. And that leads to no clear decision maker, right? Somebody comes in with a great idea, they don't know who to go to. They don't know kind of who to ask for feedback and they don't know how to make this happen. And that leads to missed opportunities to, you know, slower growth or potentially decay of the ecosystem. The public goods, right? The protocols, the, you know, explorers, tools that are not revenue generating, like, and not everything will be revenue generating, don't have a clear way to be funded. They don't have a way to be accountable when they uh, are not part of kind of some revenue generating system. And so what ends up being some company builds it because they need it, and then it also either supported by them in good case or is not, and then it you know floats in the abyss. And this is a problem that open source have. <clears throat> if you look at any open source project, it always kind of oscillates between kind of economic interests of big companies which are using this open source project and the community which is trying to kind of build in, a, in, in some direction that they believe in. And so decentralization is difficult, right? It's not, it's not kind of a natural state uh, for many things, but it increases resilience. It, incre it reduces fragility of the system and it enables us to kind of build for long term. So 
kind of looking at governance outside of Web3, right, there are two steps, right? There's a model that uh, governments use, which is a kind of multi-branch um, system where there is one branch that is representative, right? It tries to aggregate the information and feedback and representation of different stakeholders of, you know, people from different regions, of uh, people of different uh, kind of levels. And then there's an executive branch, right? This is a branch that goes out and kind of builds a platform, gets elected, and uh, executes within the laws and budget that the Congress gives them on, on those goals, and many times does not execute. And so this is kind of how governments and countries have been funding public goods, right? This is how, you know, roads are built. This is how uh, kind of a lot of other things are, are funded. And, you know, and they're focused on growth of GDP as a general, right? They're inconsistent growth in general. And then you have corporations. Corporations have a you know, clear for-profit motive. They have a clear executive uh, system that, you know, you have a CEO that everybody reports to. And the CEO reports to a board members and shareholders. Uh, in a very kind of, you know, chunked way with specific, um, like, usually more, you know, CEO of kind of doing most of the strategy execution and planning, and board members are just an oversight and a, an ability to uh, kind of let go if the CEO is not doing their job. So kind of oversight. And this is where, you know, profit maximization is happening. So if we look at Web3, the kind of generally the you know we have not figured out the governance and we have tried a lot of DAOs right and kind of across Ethereum across near and other ecosystems um, there's not have a, been something that like you know worked amazingly well and especially that scaled amazingly well right there have been two approaches two kind of major approaches one is where you have a token holder weighted decision making Right, so this is where you have something like snapshot on Ethereum with compound governance, etc., where you and Maker, where you expect some percentage of token holders to vote for stuff. The problem, obviously, is most of the token holders don't show up. As a bunch of tokens are actually like used somewhere for liquidity, like it's not the always the right way. And you know you have large holders who potentially can sway the whole vote uh, just by voting. And then you have the other approach, which things like Uniswap and others taken, where you just have a small group of people who have been selected from community, potentially having some weight with delegation, like Gitcoin, uh, that are supposed to continuously stay up to date on what's going on in the ecosystem and, and actually are you know, working pretty much for the protocol to make decisions. And uh, you know, that does not scale again, because you cannot scale that group bigger than something. Like if you look at you know, even some near examples, like at somewhere after 15 people in that group, the, kind of, the decision making and involvement of these people actually drops dramatically because they start to rely that somebody else will do the job. So we've been experimenting with a bunch of this. I think there's over 100 active DAOs. There's like five or 600 total DAOs that's been created in AstroDAO. People tried everything, you know, token holding, NFT holding, gate, uh, you know, small groups, bigger groups, multiple types of different groups with different permissions, etc. So AstroDAO has been designed to like, actually experiment with governance and see what works. And on the other side, kind of near ecosystem has went through a dramatic expansion in the past year where we went from pretty much a kind of one company building a protocol to, you know, kind of a dozen companies contributing to protocol, a dozens of kind of ecosystem funds and regional hubs, you know, proximity, human guild, foundation, like all of them contributing to go to market, right, helping projects and, and transitioning them. And so what this led to as well is like this a problem of now that there's a lot of things going on, people cannot find who is responsible for what, right, and cannot uh, discover well uh, where to start in this ecosystem. So kind of the proposed solution here, and uh, there will be m kind of more details pub published in the governance forum, and we're going to be, you know, discussing and debating and iterating on this, and as mentioned, it's not a perfect solution, but uh, the proposed is near digital cooperative. Near digital cooperative is pretty much a kind of mirroring some of the existing structure that governments use, but then leveraging the tools, leveraging the accountability and leveraging the uh, kind of the goals and instruments we have to build a better governance structure. And again, the 
will not be perfect, but we're going to continue trading. So what are the principles we want to use, right? So the, one of the biggest principles, right, of NEAR as a whole is transparency, is that we want all decisions to be publicly recorded. We want to have votes to have an explanation, right? Like we don't want people to just vote on things because they have not read even the proposal and somebody asks them to do it. We want the explanation. If they're not doing that, then maybe they should not be part of the kind of decision-making group. And we want to focus on kind of iterative communication, right, and ability to uh, kind of continuously refine the ideas, right, not just say like, okay, we made this decision and nothing, you know, now we can only do this. It needs to be kind of goal-driven, right? Again, the, it's really frequently that ecosystems kind of don't have uh, posted goals, right? NEAR has been from the beginning, you know, saying about billion users and, you know, uh, a few other kind of clear goals in the ecosystem, right? You know, being sustainable, being uh, kind of scalable. And so it's important to continue within governance to continue propagating that because this is what people can latch on when they're making decisions on what needs to go next. And we want to minimize politics, right? And whenever you have people, you'll have politics. This is inevitable. But whenever you have kind of overlap of areas of responsibilities and kind of unclarity, who is responsible for what, or people responsible, they feel responsible for the same thing, you'll have more politics. And so having a clear process on how to resolve these problems and, you know, uh, in transparent way is important to minimize this. So the Congress is split into two houses. One house is this kind of smaller group of people who are full-time involved in the ecosystem, and we call it House of Merit. It's pretty much the idea of lifting the most effective contributors in the ecosystem and making them almost a board, a, a, because they have the most context of the ecosystem, they have the most information, and they kind of involved in it, so they uh, can pretty much provide input on what is happening, what's needed, what is missing. The process, you know, we're going to be refining, but right now will be a public application and deliberation with, you know, a private vote of existing members, but that they still would need to give an explanation to the vote. The House of Merit, importantly, has a veto over the executive branch, which I'm going to be talking about, and it, as I said, serves as a board and focuses on success of the whole ecosystem, right? They're looking at it at you know, given they're coming from a different areas of the ecosystem, they will be looking at it kind of br more broadly. House of Stake on the other side, right, is this idea that we still have kind of token holders, we still have the representation, kind of this broader permissionless representation, and so anyone who has a near account that stakes will have a representation that's proportional to the square root of their stake. And this is really targeted at larger referendum style questions, right? This is the same when you have a huge referendum in your country where if you should do something or, you sh or specifically if House of Stake sees that House of Merit or Executive Branch are not doing the right job, they are able to stop them. And so this is, they naturally will focus on economic success. And that's why kind of their power in, in some ways checked because like not always the kind of short-term economic success is, uh, is uh, successful for, for long-term goals. And so the final piece, this has been kind of missing from my perspective for in most of the DAOs, or it is there, but it's not officially kind of defined. And for the most part, the DAOs that are actually functioning have something like this, is executive branch. It's really the kind of this part of the DAO that's actually responsible for taking on the strategy, you know, taking on all the inputs from the community defining the strategy and then executing and reporting to it and being accountable to the community for the goals and the, um, and the strategy. And so, you know, this includes having some kind of ministers and people who are responsible for different areas as well uh, in, the, in the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, this is where the public good funding, right, the long, the kind of short, medium term, especially funding where you, hey, we need this now and nobody's in the ecosystem is building it, we'll go and find a team, we'll go and fund this part. And this allows to kind of also have investment in inorganic growth, right? If you think of it kind of, you know, this ecosystem, if you just let it go and not do anything, like they either kind of continue growing or they collapse. And so 
to continue growing beyond the natural state, we have inorganic growth of partnerships, we have an inorganic growth of bringing some applications or users to the ecosystem. That's what executive branch is responsible for. To do this, there obviously needs to be some funds uh, with any DAO, and so the kind of governance structure is around this treasury, and uh, it allows kind of, you know, the House of Merit kind of as a board define and approve a budget for the executive branch and for the like other efforts that can be like fund to fund type of strategy. And it allows to transparently evaluate actually success of these decisions as well, right? You can actually have and should have a deliberation on the success of, the, of this. So how do we get this right? I mean, I think the important piece here is decentralization doesn't need to mean chaos, right? Which it, it very frequently does. And so having the specialization, having transparency within this, and allowing each of those groups making decisions and be accountable and transparent about them is important. And then the really important piece is meta-governance, is refining this, because like this will not work from day one. There will be some things that don't work. There will be some... Uh, narrow spots, but you know, benchmarking it and also coming together at events like this at NearCon and evaluating where we are and how we're doing is important. So the more detailed stuff is coming to Governance Forum. I would love your comments and if you have suggestions, please uh, come there and uh, thank you. Thank you, Ivia. Uh, we have a time for a small Q&A session, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Hey, hi, Ilya. Um, I had a question about how you're thinking about um, not just decision-making using governance, but also something more automated. So what I'm seeing in the industry is everybody is putting decision-making under the umbrella of governance, and governance itself is not really sorted. Uh, on the other side, you can have uh, more focus on some kind of automated uh, incentive design. Uh, so how, how do you think between uh, these two? Yeah, so the question of automated kind of incentive design is a huge one and kind of mechanism design overall. I think the, there's a few things that work well, right, which is aligning nodes to do something, aligning some, you know, uh, participants. We have not seen that well automatic systems that align people, right, beyond, like there's always some involvement needed in this process, right? And so I think like NearCrowd is probably a, an interesting example of a mechanism design for, uh, for the hum kind of for human work, for, for crowdsourcing. And even then there is still, you know, some kind of involvement at the top to, to review and, and, and uh, attract some like top level reviewers who actually kind of keep in check the whole system. And so I think this is why it's important is like whenever you have an automatic design, it's always will be like people will try to trick it, right? And so you have, you need someone in the loop who will be kind of refining it as well. And that's why, you know, you need, I do think you need some type of executive brand. And like, that, that's the thing, every system that has something, like some automated incentive design that has uh, to deal with people, has some people involved in a loop that actually, you know, make sure and are accountable for the success of this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we have one more question. You mentioned that you, um, uh, the amount of voting power you have in these sort of staking things is the square root of the amount of stake you have to prevent uh, individual large bad actors making decisions. How do you prevent those bad actors spreading their stakes over a number of accounts and simply voting that way? Yeah, so this is not designed for that per se. So there is definitely refinements to do this. Um, and so one of the refinements actually is Sweatcoin, because Sweatcoin is, a, in a way, civil resistance. You cannot walk for, you know, 100 people. Uh, <laughs> and so, so there is the idea how to add more of a, you know, like civil resistance and, you know, per, per, like proof of person rights through this. But it doesn't, like... I would suggest to add it over time. Like we actually haven't seen that much of attacks of this, of this sense, but we have seen people borrowing money and, and swaying the vote to like steal all the money. That we have seen. So <laughs> protecting against that is way more important than like somebody splitting their value because they want to be having a bigger vote. Like so far I've only seen people trying to have us, like A16Z for example, many cases does not vote because they have too, too big of a stick, right? So I think that is right now a bigger problem 
because these parties are usually more aligned with the ecosystem, at least in this bit. But we can, over time, add more of like, represent, like one person, one vote type of representation as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elian. All right. Thanks, everyone. And before we proceed with our next speakers, I just wanted to remind you that live translation available upstairs as well, so you can enjoy some iced coffee or if you need a sip of fresh air, it's also available. And uh, we have YouTube uh, live broadcast as well. You can uh, link on our event tribe. So you can find the list of, of uh, all our speakers with the schedule on Event Tribe. Just check out the link of our event. Guys, and it's time to move on. Please take your seats uh, because I'm happy to present you uh, our next speakers. Zavenna Hapitan, co-founder and CTO of Niche and Dasha Kova Nagarednyuk, Head of Contact and Community at Niche, with the talk, The Rise, Fall, and Dramatic Rebirth of the Social Media. Welcome, guys. The stage is all yours. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello. Can you hear us OK? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to start the talk with this, but I'm really bad at not saying this. It's my birthday today, everyone. It's his birthday! <laughs> Happy birthday, Zavin! Thank you, thank you. Uh, truly nothing I'd rather be doing. This is so much fun. So our talk is called The Rise, Fall, and Dramatic Rebirth of Social Media. I am Zavin. I'm the co-founder of Niche. And I'm Dasha. I'm the head of content and community at Niche. And Obviously, we both work at Niche, and so we will give you a bit of a breakdown. Very briefly, Niche is a decentralized social uh, content app. It's using the power of Web3 tech to sort of solve a lot of the problems in Web3 social media, which we will talk about for the next 15 minutes. And? And we're going to be going into our beta within a month, so we're super excited. So, this up. Let's get started. So, the first chapter, the rise. Social media started, you know, really like proper Web2 social media in earnest with, of course, MySpace and then Facebook. And um, a little more about me, I actually started my career um, in early 2012 at Facebook, right before the IPO, right around the time that Instagram was acquired. And my first intern project as uh, someone who couldn't legally drink because I was too young um, was to build a photo viewer, to rebuild a photo viewer that, you know, I think at the time something like almost a billion people used. Uh, to browse content online. Um, and, you know, back then there was like very little code review. It was kind of the mantra was move fast and break things. Um, but it was sort of like the ethos of how things were being done back then, which is young people who are naive and optimistic, kind of incompetent, building things that impact quite literally billions of people. And it was all fun and game at the time, but no one really paused to think about how some of these products would be used and what some of the repercussions of these decisions might be. Yeah, so a bit of a background about me. At the time, I was a social media producer for some of the world's leading like digital content companies. It was Refinery29, BuzzFeed, Vice, and Thrillist. You know, and at the time, same thing as Avin, I didn't realize that a lot of the videos I was making that were going viral, they were like 20 million views starting. <laughs> um, pretty much like we would sell any product. We were just incredibly influential, but we didn't understand it at the time. Uh, you know, 2017 was a really strong content year. Woo. <laughs> That's what the table's for. I know, really, <laughs> for my life. Um, yeah, so 2017 was a really strong year of content. And I think we do liken this to the fact that when Trump was elected, a lot of people felt incredibly defeated and started turning to online communities to find sort of their own spaces. Uh, a lot of this was sort of resulting in 
um, protest culture and all this other stuff online, but we also saw this happen in the Women's March. Um, so yeah, kind of throwing it back. When I was 25, working at Refinery29, I would rope in a lot of my coworkers to do these videos. It was just sort of fun and games. We weren't really thinking much into it. Again, influencing hundreds of millions of people online. And the videos were like... <laughs> Yeah, the videos talk, were like, talk about your deepest, most personal traumatic yeah, like, experience. Yeah, yeah, like literally Refinery29 was like going deep. Like it was like talk about your first time sleeping with someone. And it was just <laughs> people not really thinking because they were in a safe space when they were creating. Yeah, They yeah. didn't think it was this like very like, yeah, they didn't sort of think that anything would happen with it, especially because the content was being made for a very like ethereal platform such as, you know, Snapchat, Snapchat that would disappear in 24 hours. But because it was so high performance and it would lead to so many views, they would then repurpose it and put it on YouTube and Facebook, which now lives on forever. <laughs> so yeah, it kind of like jeopardized things there where people are uncomfortable with what existed back then. But essentially, yeah, it just kind of gets you across that a lot of what was happening at the time, we were just too naive to understand where it would lead to. Yep. And ultimately, it was all to drive ad dollars. And because this content was you know, producing a lot of ad dollar revenue, uh, of course, it wasn't ephemeral. It kept being used, and people were sharing data online without realizing um, how long that would stay on and how that might be used against them. Um, which sort of brings us into our next topic, the fall of social media. And I would say, actually, you know, 2017 was probably the peak of social media, as we know um, yeah, today. Yeah, like the golden the years. Yeah, the golden <laughs> years. Uh, 2018, something really important happened, which was the Cambridge Analytica scandal. It turned out that this company um, that was, uh, you know, essentially it was like a social game on Facebook, was actually exploiting the social graph, the, the platform APIs, to harvest people's data to use that against them, right? And it was this realization that people had globally that actually a lot of this stuff that you share um, can be harvested, your data can be sold, it doesn't belong to you, it can be used against you, it could be uh, misconstrued for whatever other things. And um, we started to realize that actually a lot of the decisions that were made by people like me when I was 19 uh, had like real societal implications. Uh, but of course, at the time, we weren't thinking about this, right? And what I saw from being at Facebook for so long, you know, for uh, the entirety of my 20s, I was there for almost 10 years, was a lot of the stuff, it, was, it wasn't evil, it was just poorly thought out. And when people were building the social platform that, you know, let an app get your name and your friends' names and the email addresses of everyone you've ever interacted with, people thought that lead to, like, some pretty cool games. They didn't think that would be harvested uh, and used against them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sort of tying back to a point that I'd made earlier as well, when we were just having fun and games with these videos, to Zavin's point, like, we didn't realize that we didn't have any ownership over these videos, that these videos belong to that company, and so they do just continue to leave on, like, live on, and that content can be used against us now. Um, but yeah, this is obviously sort of like a huge part of like the consequences that happen when we weren't thinking of it in the yeah, beginning. Yeah. Um, at the time though, when I was working for one of these media companies, I remember being in one of the media rooms for a pitch and I really wanted to pitch Rihanna because she was, I mean, she is and was one of these sort of like leading fashion icons, leading music icons. And I remember the idea was completely shut down because she wasn't a high performer. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of racial implications here, um, but she didn't bring enough ad dollars. So we went with Taylor Swift because Taylor Swift did. And, you know, it just kind of reinforces the fact that we obviously can't continue to let ad dollars run what kind of content we release and put out into the world. Because exactly, it just has exactly. so many cultural biases. Yeah, yeah. And, and from the Facebook side too, a lot of the issues were because we were optimizing for people spending as much time uh, on the app. We called it uh, time spent was like the golden metric. Uh, because the more time they spent looking at the app, the more ads they watch, and ultimately the more revenue we bring in. And that sort of leads to all of these side effects that no one's consciously thinking about, which is if you're optimizing for time spent, you want your products to be as addictive as possible. You want to keep, pe keep people coming back as much as possible. You're not really thinking about mental health, <laughs> you know, healthy behaviors. Uh, instead, you're, you're, and again, like being on the inside, people weren't evil. They're just like, oh, my team will do well if we have people spending a lot of time on our product. And that is why they made the decisions that they did, but that had humongous consequences. Yeah, I will just tie one more thing to that. The thing is, it's like totally leaning into it. A lot of the people in these companies, I think, did want to make a difference, but because it all yes, ended up just yes. coming down to like the money and it kind of turned into this capitalist approach about everything, we couldn't, it didn't become a humanitarian sort of like human position. It became where is the money coming from and what will perform best. So, yep. yeah, that leads to interlude, the drama. So, you know, this is sort of where we find ourselves now, the present day. Facebook is losing users for the first time historically. 
you know, we're seeing daily news about lawsuits, people stepping down, company failures, people even stepping down just to save face. Mm -hmm. And um, regulations. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Regulations. Like there's look at the news. Everything's sort of falling apart when it comes to the media and like, you know, social media world. But, um, you know, we're seeing companies breaking up. We're seeing companies merging just to stay afloat. A good example of this would be Refinery29 and Vice. Um, they were both direct competitors at the time. We were not allowed to make any content that even symbolized anything like the other. And now they've merged just to be able to survive. Yeah. So, you know, a big part of this is also happening between not just consumer, but also in the content creator world because content creators are finding, at least on Instagram, right, the algorithms aren't exactly setting them up for success. They're having issues sustaining their revenue and, yeah, just. But the drama is important. And, and that the drama is necessary for the revolution that we're all trying to bring about, which is the rebirth of social media. Ultimately, Web2 traditional social media didn't work out. We have learned from those mistakes. We're no longer as naive as we were you know, 10, 15 years ago. We know better and we know how to make good decisions. Um, but in order for us to get there, of course, the old guard is going to fight hard to make sure that we don't succeed. And so that's what everyone in this room is trying to do. And that's what we're all trying to solve, right, is we're trying to make Web3 communities successful and we're trying to do that by migrating everyone over from exploited web 2 media to the new world. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a really core part of what we're trying to do at Niche. We're trying to take those lessons and make a healthier social content app. Um, one of the things that we believe in very much is community because mm -hmm. we feel like ultimately humans have this need to find community, to share experiences, to share memories with other people, but to do that in a way that is healthy, to do that in a way that isn't uh, using you know, techniques learned from Vegas to make the app as addictive as possible, but rather facilitating real, genuine interactions. Mm -hmm. um, and we think actually decentralization is going to be core to that, uh, because that then gives people a true power. It's not locking them into walled gardens. They can leave, they can take their data with them, and whatever value they create goes to them and their communities rather than these big apps. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add that also, you know, at the, in the golden years, sort of the start of our presentation, um, what we had mentioned was obviously a lot of people were turning to community online at the time, but obviously there were still a lot of issues with the communities they were building out online. So I think it's always been there, and I think people had this need to find their community. So obviously yeah. now being in a de decentralized space just ultimately puts us into a better position moving forward. So I'll end this with a quote from Danny. I don't actually see her around, but she said this to me at breakfast Danny. yesterday, and I thought it was brilliant. Web2 Social was all about the individual. Web3 Social is all about the community. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, one more slide. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zoe, and thank you, Dasha. Uh, we have a time for questions, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Yeah, seems... Oh, we have a question. Okay, guys, do you have more information? Because I just opened your website, and uh, that's it. Yep, yep, that's it. Uh, do you have more information? Not right now, no, in, so in we're about a week. I was supposed to be building and launching the new website this week, but then I came uh, here. Maybe instead, so. if I will uh, put my yeah. Email here. Yes, put your yeah. email. We'll so if anybody you. wants to go to oh, our website, okay. it's niche.club, and you can put in your email and submit, and you'll get sort of an email in a few days that'll tell you, Thank yep. you. yeah about our wait list and everything else that's coming out for our beta. Niche.club. Uh, any other questions? And uh, on socials at niche protocol. Oh yeah, at niche protocol across Instagram, Twitter, Discord. Like you'll find it everywhere. <laughs> Uh, so I have a potential real hardball for you. And I'm oh, gonna... I love that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so in, on the topic of like building communities, building communities about specific interests, one thing that I think might be worth thinking about is, of course, that there are a lot of insular communities uh, centered around, let's say, ideas that maybe we don't want to promote in the modern mm -hmm. world. And this is something that social media platforms I know have really struggled with, and especially with not dealing with them in a way that is maybe problematically authoritarian given the size of their platforms. Um, not really going to ask a specific question off of that, but I wonder what you think about yeah, yeah, yeah. that topic. And how you solve for that. Yeah, I think um, it's better to have those things exist in sort of siloed parts of the internet that people can opt into rather than make it really easy for problematic content to spread amongst people virally like happens on Facebook. And so if you, I mean, if you think about it, like I've been on Reddit for years and lots of people use Reddit. There's some like pretty messed up subreddits out there, right? But, but for the vast majority of people, they're not interacting with those. They kind of stay off to themselves. 
what you start to run into uh, with Facebook, and I worked actually a lot on misinformation where I, I built a screen that says, are you sure you want to share this? This content is problematic. Um, is something can go from me to my friends to their friends to their friends, and now a million people have seen it. And not having sort of those like clearly defined spaces actually leads to stuff sort of you know, share, being shared more widely that is problematic. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty good point. I think that's adequate for me for now. Okay, good. Amazing. Anyone else? Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I think we're good for now. Thank Yay. you so much, guys, for your presentation. Yay! Uh, and I just have a small announcement for everyone who is upstairs now. We have a plenty of space here downstairs. We have AC, so you can bring your coffee with you and join us downstairs. Uh, and before we move on, I wanted to remind you that after all speakers, we will have happy hours with some drinks and our beautiful terrace just to close our near space. Uh, these three amazing days we've spent here. So there will be a chance to enjoy some drinks on the terrace. And we are ready to proceed with our speakers. I'm happy to present you Nadim Kabesi, founder of Capsule Social, with the talk Decentralization Disclosure for Writers and Content Creators on Web3. Welcome. All right. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. I live in Paris, so I'm always here, but it's nice to be here on this boat, more specifically. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about what we've been building on top of Nier for the past year and a half. We're building this thing, it's called blockchain. Blockchain, as it turns out, it's very hard to communicate what I'm talking about when I'm discussing this orally with people. And we should have thought about this before getting this name, but incredibly, blockchain wasn't trademarked anywhere in the US or in Europe, which is insane. But yes, what is blockchain? Uh, essentially, we are looking at Nier as a very promising and engineer-friendly Web3 platform to build what I can very basically describe as a sort of combination between Substack and Twitter. It's a place for publishing, it's a place for discourse, it's a web application that I hope is fun to use, and you can sign up and start using it today. The idea is that we want to offer writers better content resilience guarantees um, against um, unaccountable moderation, political censorship, which might be important to journalists and other uh, such uh, individuals in certain parts of the world. But we also want to provide more transparent accountability. And by building on Web3 technologies, we can accomplish all of this. So things to keep in mind regarding the guiding principles of blockchain is the decentralization that we've accomplished by building on top of Near as well as IPFS for content. Censorship resistance that comes not at the expense of responsible and governance-based content moderation. We do believe that content moderation has its place and is very important. Uh, Community-based governance that is facilitated by Web3 um, engineering design principles as well as the way that smart contracts and token-based governance can work in general for a platform such as ours. And uh, yeah. Let's talk about the uh, architecture and what we're using to build the platform. And I, I'll hopefully also show you the platform more generally in a minute. Essentially, we decided to use OrbitDB and IPFS. So OrbitDB is a sort of a database layer on top of IPFS that allows us to do things like content validation and namespacing. And we're using IPFS for the wholesale storage of content. A uh, blockchain node, so to speak, is instantiating an OrbitDB uh, instance as well as connecting to the near blockchain. So it's dual technologies that are being used at the same time. Uh, we have transparent community-based governance that's enacted via the fact that, so for example, let's say you want to moderate something on Twitter uh, or on Facebook. Sometimes moderation can be tricky. For example, it might be the case that you're moderating a certain debate that's occurring halfway across the world, and you don't have the necessary cultural or political context in order to enact moderation in a way that makes sense. As such, uh, you can end up in sticky situations where basically a singular office somewhere in Silicon Valley is moderating a discussion regarding, I don't know, religious traditions in the Middle East, let's say. In our case, all moderation tools that are available either to us or to the community uh, that's moderating via community governance process 
are actually encoded in smart contracts. So we're using that in order to provide a community-based governance process such that everyone is enfranchised into the moderation process. And we're hoping that this will basically allow um, individuals to have a higher level of confidence regarding any concerns uh, that have to do with um, censorship or bias, which I'm not saying necessarily exists all the time on other platforms, but the idea here is confidence. The idea here is enfranchising people into this process and users into this process. And this is what Web3 technology allows us to do. Another thing is that our algorithms for the way that posts are displayed and so on are fully transparent and open source. They are, in that sense, on smart contracts, but they are, in that sense, as well, on our code bases. And that also, in general, gives a broader assurance regarding the platform itself. Um, this is where I was supposed to use my laptop to sort of demo the thing, but I can't. So let's talk more about the actual features, and I can sort of like explain to you right now what it is. Basically, you, you know how on, so you know how like on Substack you can start a newsletter that people can subscribe and pay you for that newsletter? When you create an account on blockchain, you sort of have that feature set as well. But at the same time, you can also immediately start publishing, but use that same account to read and follow other people the same way that you would do on Twitter. It really takes the best of the Twitter user experience and the best of the Substack user experience in order to provide social features, news feeds, reposting, sharing, and discovery features that a lot of other platforms don't have, but at the same time allowing people to hopefully express themselves in more interesting and nuanced ways than just a 280-character tweet, which tends to lead to, to put it mildly, unproductive discussions. Uh, we allow uh, users to be remunerated either via fiat or cryptocurrency, which is kind of unique uh, in the field. We provide uh, a lot of very accessible features to individuals coming from both Web3 and Web2. So if you're coming from Web2, you can actually use our Web3 auth bridge in order to create an account and log into blockchain just using your Google account or your Discord account. You don't have to connect your wallet, which can be limiting for individuals that are not familiar with the fact that connect your wallet replaces the login button or the create account button on Web3 platforms. We also have this very cool author dashboard that allows authors that are writing and publishing on blockchain to see what, how people are engaging, excuse me, how people are engaging with their content. And so that's nice. Uh, one thing that has really guided our design principles here is the fact that we are trying very hard in order to ensure that this is a pleasant user experience and that we're not sort of dragged down by the fact that we're on Web3. You know, it's not harder to use. It's not more complicated. The user experiences are not sort of like ruthlessly new. And we're trying to build a user experience that's actually pretty performant. So one really impressive thing that uh, my engineering team, I'd like to give a shout out to the amazing engineering team, uh, Christos, uh, Jack, David, Ashutosh, Rahul, and others um, that we have at the company. They've been able to build a blockchain such that when you actually open it and start using it, what you're doing is instantiating a full IPFS node in your browser and loading content dynamically. Right? And that works without any slowdowns and is truly decentralized. This took a lot of work, actually. Uh, the near smart contract calls are also really fast. This is because near itself is kind of nice to use, so thank you to the near team for building something that we can actually use to develop stuff, which is nice. Um, but in general, it's also, you know, we're very proud of the fact that we've built a truly Web3 platform, but that doesn't come with the sort of uh, current uh, lack of polish that can sometimes be seen. In, in Web3, which is totally understandable because it's so new. But we've really gone the extra mile and tried to produce something that works. I hope we've succeeded. Uh, blockchain launched recently. If we're certainly looking at this point, I think the technology itself is looking good, but we are looking now to onboard content creators and writers and to start building a brand. So we've had a lot of really amazing pieces recently. For example, we had Professor Eric Bihar, who recently published a piece on whether or not the Nobel, Peace Pri uh, the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, is an intellectual fraud. So he, has, he criticizes the history of the Nobel Prize in Economics. We've had a piece published by Cypress in the UK about the history of acid anarchism in the United Kingdom. We've had pieces published on uh, the, the Russian aggression and war on Ukraine from people within uh, Ukraine. And we've also had a piece published on just general uh, philosophical and social commentary on the dangers of centralized discussion and social media, especially in the age of COVID. 
uh, we were really excited about facilitating those discussions. And at the same time, we're excited about the guarantees that we can give writers. So in our case, let's say, for example, that someone, um, so we don't allow illegal content on the platform. And if someone posts truly objectionable content, we will absolutely delist the content and remove it, either ourselves or via the eventual community governance process that we plan to implement. But even so, writers still implement what we're calling content resilience, uh, writers still obtain what we're calling content resilience guarantees. What that means is that even if content is delisted and becomes invisible on our platform, so long as you have the IPFS content ID for it, you can still load it using blockchain, using blockchain if an IPFS node around the world continues to host the content. So we make it easier for you know, decentralized nodes outside of our jurisdiction to make the independent decision to continue to host that content themselves. They certainly bear the brunt of the moral and ethical and legal responsibility for doing so, but at least we sort of decentralize that decision in a way that seems more sensible. Furthermore, like I said earlier, I want to draw back attention to this um, because I'm not sure that I covered it sufficiently. Uh, the fact that we use smart contracts for all content moderation operations means that we basically could code things in such a way that, for example, even, our, even the high-level moderators of the platform are unable to ban an account unless there have been previous calls to the smart contract uh, encoding uh, three strikes to that account for, for violation of rules. And those strikes perhaps will need to be validated by other members of the governance process in a transparent fashion, a publicly auditable fashion. So we're really excited about merging these accountability and democratic uh, sort of processes into a platform that I think is genuinely as easy and fun to use as the platforms that all of us are used to. And uh, I'd like to use this opportunity to, to announce that as of today, uh, blockchain is now, uh, we used to be on the near testnet, but now as of today, it's going to be on the near mainnet. Uh, and I would strongly encourage you to sign up. You don't need to, well, it would be nice if you used your near account, uh, your, your, your near wallet but you don't need to. You can actually just sign up with your Google account or your Discord account. And I strongly encourage you to give that a try um, today and to just check out the platform for yourself. And keep in mind that we also have a writer's grant program right now. If you would like to pitch a topic and you want to write about it, and it's an interesting topic, we will do our best to help you gain an audience on blockchain of people that might be interested in your writing. Uh, the, for example, we've received a lot of engagement specifically on that Nobel uh, uh, prize of economics uh, feature that I mentioned earlier. It received a lot of f attention, mainly on our face from our Facebook page for some reason. People on Facebook really were nuts about that post. But um, in general, we're hoping to have uh, a similar marketing impact that we can produce for your content in case you choose to write with us. And I hope that you'll consider that possibility. But if you just want to sign up and try out the platform, maybe just post a, your personal blog or anything like that, that's okay too. We welcome anyone using our platform to have better discussions online. You'll notice that the user experience as a whole also facilitates that. I encourage you, for example, to take a look at our uh, illustrations and the um, commenting experience. You'll, you'll see what I mean when you take a look. Um, thank you very much for your time. It's exciting to build on top of NIR, and I want to extend a thank you to the NIR team for being so supportive uh, during our year and a half of building on top of blockchain and launching it three weeks ago. I have about three minutes left, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Um, any questions? The, the website is blockchain.app, by the way. I should have mentioned that. Yeah, I think we're out of questions for now. Oh, we have a question. Great. Hi, thank you. Um, how are you planning on doing user adoption? Because, you know, like Reddit has a huge community and that's why people contribute and there's a lot of other ones like that. Um, obviously, people want to have a voice, so how are you planning on getting users to your platform? User adoption so far has been a painstaking process that resembles Roots campaigning. And this is, I believe, largely because some of our competitors, such as Substack, have such large brand recognition. So I will tell you very openly that it's actually quite difficult. What we're doing right now is, you know, we're working on different fronts at the same time. We're trying to build a platform that is superior from a user experience standpoint, that offers more guarantees to writers, as I've mentioned earlier, but we're also engaging directly with writers in order to give them grants and to promise them that we will, we will work on integrating them as a centerpiece in our uh, marketing strategy, such that uh, we will promote their work and do our best to gain them 
uh, paying subscribers. We're doing so on a writer by writer basis. It's something that's going to take maybe a year of solid relationship building with writers and publishers and content creators. I don't expect it to happen overnight. And it's actually, according to our research, very similar to what Substack was doing when they launched in our current stage. Uh, I'm happy to talk to anyone who uh, has any feedback or can maybe produce um, some insights regarding this task, which I'm sure is going to be daunting and require a lot of work. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I want to ask about economics and from where protocol will earn could you, money. Could you please bring the microphone closer to yeah, your mouth? Uh, I want to ask about economics and from uh, where protocol we will get some money. So uh, currently we have a very basic uh, paid subscription features that mirrors what Substack has. So you uh, can subscribe to someone writing content. They can create different tiers for subscriptions. You can, they can choose to charge $5 a month, $10 a month, or the equivalent in cryptocurrency. And that's the sort of initial basic way that we intend for writers to get paid. And obviously the, we take a cut off of that, so we take 10%. Uh, off of that uh, as a way for the company to make revenue. But this is just a very basic initial sort of revenue generation mechanism. In the future, we plan to actually exploit the fact that we're a Web3 platform in order to diversify the ways that people can make money on blockchain. And this would include, for example, so one example I like to use is the fact that, say, for example, you're um, uh, someone who writes reviews about cars. You could sell an, a sponsor spot in your article as an NFT. And that way, when someone, you know, we can create a marketplace for sponsors to actually buy sponsorship spots within content and actually be able to cryptographically verify that the sponsor spot will appear inside that piece of content at that exact time via a cryptographically validated transaction. So we can create a marketplace for, for uh, advertising directly between, direct advertising between sponsors and content creators with their consent. Uh, similar to how YouTube influencers work these days. But we can also diversify that marketplace such that the token that you accrue is, uh, from being part of the governance process of blockchain can actually be used uh, to stake and unlock content and to also do other stuff of that nature on the platform. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, and I think it's time to move on. Yes? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think. Thank you so much. Let's... So, and I'm happy to present you our next speaker, Kelly Pereira, International Vice President of Ape Square Creative, with a talk Gamify with Gaming How to Build Your Community. The stage is all yours. Hi, thank you for coming to hear me speak. Um, as mentioned, I'm Vice President of Ape Square Creative. Uh, you may not have heard of the studio, but there's a reason why. Um, we were actually in high-end animated feature film production previously, and we also had a gaming division that was uh, specialised in AAA console games. And it's only within the past year that we've merged the two together to create a new studio um, in metaverse development. So we're currently in production on a AAA cinematic MMORPG. I don't know if there's, everyone's from gaming, but that's a mass multiplayer online role play game. So that's kind of the, the bigger metaverse style of games. Um, I'm going to talk about community building within Web3 Gaming. It's kind of split into two main audience sectors when it comes to the gameplay users. So you have your play to earn gamers or P2E players and then your more traditional gamers. So I've just put some examples here of the more well-known metaverse or Web3 based uh, games. In the right hand there is the more typical play to earn ones. So those are the ones that are driven by the tokenomics. And then here are the more the projects that are more focused on the game side. So they still have the earning aspect, but they're led by the game rather than by the earn. Um, so that kind of brings me to the first point when it comes to community building. Um, and, and I know that it's not revolutionary in any way, but it's really, really important to understand who your audience is because you can not only just not capture the audience that you're aiming for, but you will actually alienate them if you have the right audience with the wrong approach. And I think this is something that we kind of see right across 
Web3 space. So um, whether, you know, the approach or the strategy that you would take to trying to harness the existing Web3 audience for a brand, for example, is like a different approach to what you would do if you were trying to bring a Web2 audience into the Web3 space. And it's the same in the gaming. So if you're trying to target those uh, play to earn players, how you would approach them is very, very different to how you'd approach the more traditional uh, gaming community. So in terms of what motivates them, place to earn players are just purely there for personal, monetary or asset acquisition um, from the project. So it's what they can earn from that. Whereas if you compare that with the game, the more traditional gaming community, it's all about the gameplay. So with the gamers in particular, there is a real stigma around Web3. So if you mention anything like NFT or IDO or crypto, you will kind of immediately alienate that traditional gaming audience. Um, and the reason that has come around is because... I don't, how many people are from gaming background at all? Okay, not too many. Um, so I've, you would have heard me... Oh, God, the boat just started rocking. Um, you would have heard me just mention uh, AAA. So that is an actual game production um, grading. So that's the highest level of production. It will be graded. This is a Web2 thing um, based on the size of your production, the scale of your game. Um, so it starts at Web3 and then works back. So the early adopters of people bringing gaming into the Web3 space uh, came out and branded themselves as AAA projects. So the traditional gaming community came to kind of see what these AAA projects were. And when they arrived, they were very much not AAA projects. In fact, they were, actually, they were quite low production. So from that point, it kind of had this stigma of anything gaming to do with Web3 is very poor quality. So there is a bit of a sentiment shift that's happening at the moment, which I'll talk about a bit later, but that's essentially where this stigma has come from. And it's really important to understand that when you come to start building your communities, depending on who your audience is. And so building communities, how do you do it? So the play to earn, has it come up? Play to earn side, if that is where your product is aimed, um, you would do something like this, and I'm just giving an example here, like obviously everyone does it differently, but you would typically lead with your IDO and your assets, usually around two to three months ahead of your product launch. That's essentially what your users are here for. They're here for, for the assets. Um, it would all be based on hype marketing. You would have a public discord. Um, so the hype marketing is really important. That's things like giveaways, whitelists, um, airdrops, doing collaborations with other play-to-earn communities on invite contests, anything that's like a reward-based incentive, then that's where your community is going to start building. And it's almost like you don't need, really even need to have a target of what your audience would want to be, what you'd want it to be for that Discord community, because if you're doing incentive-based rewards, then they will come, and they will keep coming, and they will keep growing. Um, but that is kind of something to be mindful of when you go and set out your Discord, is that that whole management, which will be like your hype period before your, before your, <coughs> excuse me, before your asset drop, um, it's very, very resource heavy. So you need a really big team of mods that are managing all of the traffic that are coming into the channel, keeping that hype up, keeping all the activity. Um, a huge thing to be mindful of is any community that you're building that is either fast growing or has reward based incentives um, is going to inevitably attract a huge amount of bots. So you wouldn't necessarily know if you have a community of 60,000, 20,000 of those could be bots and you wouldn't know until the point that you come to do your drop. So that's also something to be mindful of. And then also um, paper hands. Uh, I think that this is an NFT term rather than just gaming, but your paper hands are the guys that have probably already done all of this pre-promotional activity. They might have earned quite a few of the free airdrops. So when you come to Mint and they get their airdrop, they will immediately relist it for a really, really low valuation, which then inevitably affects your floor price. Um, and then they also, and I'm still not to this day figured out why they do this, but they will also purchase an NFT at Mint and then straight away list it for less than what they paid for. And I don't really understand why that happens, but it does. Um, but obviously, from a, a developer's point of view, having your assets on sale for much less than what people paid for at the beginning is just not a good look. So you need to just be really careful that you're not building a community that is largely built with these paper hands or flippers. Um, instead, you want to be building up your diamond hand community. So again, as much as you need 
the resource to manage the big public discord, you also need a really strong community manager who is going to take real care of those Genesis holder, VIP, diamond hands, and critically, well, more importantly, is expand them so that you have a community that's based on loyalty to the project rather than what they can get out of the game. Um, and then also your guilds, they're really important. I think there's a real fine line distinction between the projects that are play to earn and play and earn. So that comes at the point when um, you, you play to earn players will be the ones that come into your game and they will grind, they will do daily tasks that then gives them the, the in-game currency rewards. So th it's at this point that kind of dictates whether you're a P2E or a play and earn game um, because the user for a play to earn will at that point extract the currency, convert it into crypto, convert it into fiat, and not put anything back in. A lot of the play to earn games are free to enter, so you don't have to put anything in the pot. Um, like Axie Infinity is a really good example of a typical play to earn game. Um, their users are earning about $10,000 a month without having to put anything in in the first place. So it's all about extraction, which just means it's not really a sustainable business model for those types of games. Um, the, the distinction of when you become a play and earn is if you have a really good connection with your guilds or your DAO members, having the right DAOs in place with the right focus and the right aims that align with your project means that when those uh, rewards are earned in game, that some of it will be put, put back into the game and recycled. So it provides that kind of longevity. So you really need to have a good connection with your, with your DAOs and your guilds. And then if we compare that to the gaming community, um, you would kind of do the opposite. Or well, you certainly wouldn't lead with an IDO or an, uh, an NFT sale, because like I mentioned, there is this stigma for traditional gamers around those types of words. So you could do a model where you do game first and have your gamers in and actually using the, using the game and you, you build up your, your loyalty to the brand from doing that first and then later you can do your NFTs. Or even if you don't want to do like game first and NFT second, you could do, they, they would certainly have to be very, very close together. Um, or you can even do waves. So all of these are, I mean, that's the second point I've put there around language use is rather than call these NFTs for traditional gamers, just changing the nuancing of language and calling them game playable assets or in-game assets. Like these, this is language that they're very used to, of course, in Web2 games, in-game assets and purchasable items have been around all this time. So it's no different. It's just changing the language to language that gamers understand and not using language that they're kind of against at this point in, in adoption. Um, so yeah, the rest of um, a, a game, a traditional game distribution would be the usual things that a Web2 distribution would follow. So going to game cons, working with influencers on Twitch and Steam. Closed Discord is quite a big thing for the more high-value gaming-led projects. So this is where it will either be invite only to Discord, or I've seen projects even going one step further where it's now done on application basis. So people are actually applying to be part of the Discord communities in order to have um, access to the first demo release, for example, which isn't publicly available. So that's something that we'll be doing with our project, um, and in particular, the uh, Medium blog posts. We'll have two Medium accounts. So the first would just be the kind of general project release updates, and then the second is going to be our game developer Medium. So we're building our project on Unreal Engine 5, and the, the game developers, they can upload all of their working progress game production direct from UE5 to the Medium blog post. So anyone that's really into wanting to understand whether a gaming project is going to be high quality, they will have already seen the work in progress stuff before. So at the point you come to launch, you've kind of already got that seal of approval. If um, and then I'm just conscious of time. I've got three minutes left. Um, what I've just said there is very black and white, um, and it's not like that, really. It's not that play to earn players are here and games over here. This is probably more of a realistic, you know, there's, there's a bit of overlap, and particularly more recently, there has been a bit more of an approach to mass adoption. I think a lot of that is coming from the fact that these AAA games that are true AAA, they've you know, been in the pipeline for a few years now, so now they're starting to come out to the market. So they've really kind of lifted the viewpoint of what Web3 game is, and gamers are now realizing that Web3 technology isn't about necessarily what you can earn, but it's about what you can own. So the ownership of in-game assets is a real benefit. 
Um, and I think, obviously, in particular, the market conditions, um, the, the gaming industry hasn't necessarily been impacted in the same way as some of the other markets, you know, crypto. Um, there is still a demand for games. There's new games coming out every day, but certainly the users have been impacted. So particularly these play to earn, um, they might have lost all of their crypto. So there's just no liquidity left to be putting back into the play to earn type games like Axie Infinity, for example. So I think what we'll see at the end of the market is a lot more like this, where it's going to be gamers who are there and loyal to your project for the gameplay, but they're also harnessing the impact, uh, the advantages of web three technology, or at least I hope you are, because that's what I'm building. Um, so thank you. I'm kind of out of time, but you could do a question, or I'm staying around anyway, if anybody wants to just come and grab me afterwards. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your presentation. Uh, if you have some questions now, you can ask right now. That's great. We have such amazing audience today. A lot of questions. Hi. So. <laughs> A little background, I've been playing games since I was probably 11 yep. at this point and, and was playing them for a very long time. I've, I've watched a lot of these kind of funding systems over the years, things mm -hmm. like Kickstarter, things mm -hmm. like, like that, or playing into Patreon for projects, that kind of thing. Something that I think about a lot, and this is actually why I was deeply skeptical of Axie Infinity when it first came out, is that I feel as if when you attach monetary value, mm -hmm. I mean, first things first, game design is very hard. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize that game design is extremely hard to get something that really works. And if you introduce financial incentives, mm -hmm. often that ends up corrupting the game, yeah. both the, the way that it's developed and the way that it's played. Mm. I think about, if you're familiar with Diablo 3, back when it first yeah. came out, it actually had a real money auction house mm -hmm. for players to sell items. And the game, as a result of trying to create this scarcity for the items that you could earn, the game was very bad mm. and was widely panned mm -hmm. at release, largely because it was very unpleasant to play under those circumstances. So um, I guess, and I'm sorry, every time I ask a question, I end up no, rambling. No, it's really interesting. I kind of I'm lose, learning. <laughs> I, I end up rambling and I lose the kind of the main point, so I can't really sum that up. But <laughs> I, um, Are you asking like how you avoid bringing in earning yes, without yes, ruining you, the gameplay? I, mean, I, can, I can imagine some scenarios where you'd be able to do some grassroots funding from like communities okay. that are interested in particular projects or you know, NFTs re representing a certain ownership of a project. But beyond that, I, I do worry about how you could incorporate ownership in games without um, making the games exploitative or painful to play. Um, and one way that we're tackling it is by not having all of our NFTs just finished and ready to go. So we're going to do things like have blueprints where within our metaverse, the players will have to, you, you purchase the, the blueprint for an item and then the, the user has to go around and collect certain items to build that in-game asset, which is then theirs that's ownable. Sorry, what did you say? Oh. Yeah, to then resell. So it's not, I mean, it's just very unweb three, really, to have the project developer developing everything, uh, f handing everything finished anyway. Like, we want it to be a more decentralized structure and have the actual players do, do the work for us. But it means that they, you know, they can be on, off chain and on chain NFTs. So they, there might be the certain aspect where, in, if ordered for them to want to resell, to turn it into an NFT, they may have to purchase an item for them to then bring it on chain. But actually, the creation of the assets is part of the game, um, but that's done off chain. So that's just one way that we're trying to not just deliver loads of finished NFTs and say, here's the price and this is what you have to pay. Um, another thing that I think is important as well is just if you are going to do finished NFTs, that have you know possible game playable attributes so whether it's a vehicle um, and you buy that certain vehicle that makes you go faster um, is finding that balance meaning that it's not just the rich people who can afford the nfts that are then able to win the game and the people that don't have the money to afford the limited edition vehicles for example therefore don't have a chance um, we're still figuring that out, but it might be something around how vehicles can degrade and you have to upgrade them or maintain them. Just It's something that we're looking at because we definitely want to make sure that you, know, you have to have income in your game to survive. You do, but making sure that it's not just the people that can afford to play that are the ones that can then win. So I'll let you know when I've figured it out. I'm still, I'm still working on it. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the audience?
you can always ask any questions uh, in person. We have a lot of time till the end of uh, uh, our near space today. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Kelly. Thank and you. Again. <laughs> I just want to let you know that we are right in the middle of our speaker's hours uh, and I'm happy to present you our next speaker, Anton Weisbert, head of Near UA, with a talk how our regional hubs contributing to the ecosystem. <laughs> So, hello. Um, thanks for coming, first of all. Um, yeah, so my name is Anton Weisbert. Um, maybe I will start, uh, start our talk. Um, taking some time to talk a little bit about myself and a little bit about the background, why we've built the uh, near Ukraine hub and how it's all started, how it's evolved, what are we doing now. But overall, uh, if we if we talk about the communities, and um, like I would say that uh, regional part of it and like regional communities are super important because uh, like definitely people uh, want to to uh, discuss some stuff in their own languages, and uh, I will talk a, a little bit more about uh, why we think it's important to have like true decentralization and like having the hubs and regional model as a part of the overall decentralization, which should not only be uh, the like, governance model or uh, overall how the uh, protocols uh, think about uh, themselves, but also how, how it is structured in terms of, uh, in terms of overall organization. So, um, as, I, as I mentioned, my name is Anton Weisbert. Uh, like my previous background is uh, I'm leading the Near Ukraine Hub. My previous background um, is the um, creation of the startups, basically uh, uh, Detrix as a no-code tool for analytics and machine learning. We've been to Y Combinator two years ago, and like Detrix is uh, still operational. Um, then I'm uh, like general partner and seed venture partners, the fund, the, the fund that helps like Ukrainian founders uh, on the early stages, and and our new fund which we're, we've established specifically for near ecosystem projects. Um, yeah, and my, my, uh, I've been technical for some time. I'm not doing uh, technical stuff anymore, but I've, uh, I used to, to do uh, analytics and data science uh, in both Barclays and like technology consultancy space. So um, how we actually started the uh, regional hub? Like, uh, as a company, Detrix actually provides the insight and analytics and been providing insights for it. Uh, for it. it was like a cross-domain platform, general platform. And uh, at some point in time, we started, uh, started providing uh, like insights for, for Near, and it was maybe more than a year ago, uh, creating the different dashboards, creating the uh, understanding of the, uh, a lot of things around the, overall communities, dApps, and what's going on under the hood, matching the uh, on-chain data. <coughs> and um, like, it was some time, and then um, like actually uh, Near became like one of the biggest clients for, for Datrix, and like, we started building some different stuff on Near, some different ideas, and then that's how we've started the, uh, the overall idea of uh, this near Ukraine or near Ukrainian hub. Um, I think like right now, um, I, I will mostly talk about uh, my personal um, experience and our personal experience as a team of uh, building the regional hub. And I think it's kind of a uh, reflection on how we are seeing the community's development overall. But uh, to, for ourselves, like we, uh, we, we think about the uh, decentralization, as I mentioned, in the way of uh, also doing it on like entities level, on um, doing some stuff uh, which is not always organized in the way when one, uh, when uh, it is directly managed and vertically managed. And so, regional hub is a part, overall regional hub's idea, and like then 
uh, the guys such as like proximity oriented and DeFi or like human guild are important in terms of um, like spreading the uh, both responsibilities and actually providing the uh, the possibility to do the teams uh, something independently. Uh, the other idea is the uh, localizing of the communities, right, and uh, making sure that uh, um, we can we can onboard not only people who are uh, already actively involved in either near or any other like ecosystem, but <coughs> uh, uh, onboarding like new users and like this is why like meetups are so important because you can gather, you can discuss something, and. For sure, it's both from developer side and from the uh, user side, where we are, we are really good at uh, overall, like the blockchain space is quite good in uh, satisfying the demands of developers. It's like, I think crypto is overall the road that was created like as a developer's first community, especially for us. So it's definitely time to, uh, to onboard new users and new categories because um, Overall, <coughs> uh, overall, like we cannot reach one billion uh, users, like only talking to like the developers. So, like bringing the like local users, working with local partners, is super important to 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 onboard like new use cases. Um, yeah, and but for sure, it's it should not be like the uh, you know the development in the any like random direction. It should be kind of contribution to the overall goal and like this is the goal of like providing the world with the possibility to uh, for the people to have their own assets like uh, their own data and so on so this is kind of the motivation why why we think that this structure uh, works with regional hubs overall and where are we now we are at 50 people uh, roughly maybe already 60 but 50 plus and as a regional hub, when we are saying regional hub, from one perspective, it's like a separate entity for profit entity. But actually, uh, except of this, it is a community of people. Like we are gathering people together. We are we are doing a fund to, uh, like as a venture arm, to support to support like uh, <coughs> uh, teams who are starting who come to us to uh, with either like the need for technical support or like for money. Uh, we are actually a venture lab, as like maybe um, there is a lot of things that need to be done, and like we are good at building products, and specifically like the local specifics is that a, like usually we, we started from Ukraine, and so like we have a lot of developers, and we are good at building products. So uh, the product lab maybe is our uh, most effective, let's say, uh, mechanism to. Um, to, to deliver something, yeah, and maybe the, the largest part of what we are doing is uh, venture lab, a product lab, like venture build or whatever. And then we are doing some other functions uh, such as aggregation of the jobs and so on. So here we have a number of different things. <coughs> Most common question I have been asked is, near Ukraine, where are you, where are you guys? And I'm saying, okay, like we are in Lisbon. Yes, we are in Lisbon. So uh, with the start of the war, we actually uh, moved, uh, moved to Lisbon and created like Ukraine and uh, Portugal hub. We've been thinking about doing uh, like having second office in, uh, in Lisbon for some time, but it appeared that it's, uh, it appeared like our first office, our main office, and like we are, we are like shifting slightly towards the being like near Europe. So like actually covering both Ukraine and Portugal right now, like going to build like a physical space in Kashkai, like it's near Lisbon. And um, yeah, we are doing some stuff like uh, we cannot like avoid, you know, uh, thinking about well, what happened with Ukraine. So like uh, we are providing a lot of uh, like social initiatives, like help for the people who uh, get out of Ukraine, so away from Ukraine.com. Uh, and like the other thing I'm actually <coughs> uh, like uh, calling everybody to to support like our own validator uh, like is doing this and uh, we encourage other validators to to do this kind of stuff so actually we are just uh, the part of the staking rewards we are taking like uh, like two percent is going directly to Ukraine 
uh, wallet like it's without uh, like near extension, just Ukraine, which we created specifically for like Ukrainian government and like actually adoption in Ukraine of crypto is uh, really high at the moment. <laughs> so um, like it's really like con controlled by uh, Ukrainian officials, like Ministry of Digital Transformation. So they're using this directly. And the interesting thing is that sometimes they're paying directly in like near for something, not not only like uh, doing the off ramp on ramp stuff. So like and this is kind of the case. Like a lot of the chains actually supporting Ukraine and providing the money, but uh, for us it's like the easiest way is to build it in our uh, in our validator in, in the, our uh, everyday life. So I will talk a little bit more about what are we doing uh, as a part of uh, our uh, our um, regional hub. Like as I mentioned, the <coughs> major thing is the product lab, we name it like Binary Star, uh, as an entity. So basically, uh, there are a lot of uh, projects we've started right now. It's more than seven. So maybe the most interesting are like we are working on. Uh, our actually uh, the um, background and expertise of our team is mostly working with B two B and uh, working with like traditional businesses. So, like one of the things we are doing is like a central bank digital currency or CBDC. The other stuff is like Datrix, our company, and Vombi, uh, which is the, doing the user analytics and acquisition. The gig pay like payment, uh, which is super important, like to have the easy way to to pay contractors uh, in crypto and do the like bulk payments and make sure that it's it works with your accounting system this is something which we are struggling with and usually we are actually trying to solve the problems we are uh, we are struggling with and that's how the product ideas for product lab are created we are also uh, helping the uh, the central bank team like doing some stuff um, then doing some crypto lending, like in the, uh, in Africa, is rewarded engagement, and they potentially can uh, enjoy, learn to earn, and move to earn. And that's a much bigger chunk. That's uh, that's a billion people, and that's something that we believe is going to be the next uh, uh, population uh, segment that we will see within Web3. Now. More specifically, they tend to be younger uh, audience from the developing markets, such as Brazil, Turkey, India, Southeast Asia. We're seeing lots of appetite there. You guys are aware how crypto is popular in the place, places like the Philippines and the Vietnam. And uh, we're seeing a huge uh, surge in our new registrations, specifically in Latin America. Uh, a vast majority of users that are on board in the past six to nine months they on board kind of knowing that crypto is powerful, crypto is here. They haven't been able to capitalize from it, but they're really looking forward to it. So uh, what does it take to get the next billion people, to get those users excited about crypto? And what actually prevents them, uh, why they are not yet with crypto? I think that there's a couple of really big barriers there. The first one, and we all know it, it's uh, a pretty shitty UX. I mean, in order for you to create a, a, a wallet uh, by Neo, of course, which is a completely different story, but you know, we know that creating a wallet is a pain in the neck. So it's not easy. And then even if you invested uh, quite a bit of your time and your brain into that cumbersome process, you still have to pay. And that's not inexpensive. So, You've got two major barriers there, and this is really, really hard to overcome those. Part of the reason we actually ended up deciding to go with Nier is that Nier is just so much focused on uh, our user experience, and that was always our number one priority, to make an experience so easy, so natural and organic, that even like a 12-year-old kid from California or a grandma from Malaysia could rely to that easily. So from that perspective, Nier is a very, very natural combination and a very natural fit to what we do. So uh, in order to make those users interested and excited, you have to build an experience that's free to use, doesn't really have an, you know, a massive uh, barrier to, for entry. Uh, you want to be able to have something that's easy to understand. And finally, the modern generation is, you know, as we know, 
very, very receptive to rewards. So rewards is a, is a, is a tricky beast, though, because if you don't really administer it properly, then rewards is what, you know, is all there is. So there was a question earlier here. So how do you actually build a game and how do you incorporate the reward element to it? My, my uh, response to that is very simply. So people should be there not for rewards. They should be there for the user experience. The user experience should be either useful or fun or ideally both. And then rewards, you know, serves as a rocket fuel. So rewards can make your user experience stickier. It can make it even more rewarding or exciting. But if there's nothing but rewards, it's not going to be sustainable. So from that perspective, if you look at Axie, you look at Steppen, it's not really sustainable because the only reason people play it is rewards. And if you were left to your own devices, you'd probably not, like I, again, uh, full disclosure, obviously kind of a competitor to us, but Steppen, uh, painful to play. I did try to do it. Uh, Axie, did I, would I play it without um, it being rewarding? Probably not. So I think at the end of the day, you really want to build an experience that's either useful or exciting or both. Uh, so um, in terms of rewards more specifically, so when I say useful, I think that it's very important to understand what's the underlying experience that you're rewarding. And that underlying experience should somehow be valuable to the user. What I mean by that is that what we see from our users is that, yeah, they kind of go, yeah, fine, you reward my steps and everything is kind of cool. But the, the net net result is that I end up walking more. And that's inherently good for me. I think this is really important. And this is what makes users stick for a much longer period of time. Uh, and I think that that translates into a, uh, a sustainable uplift in physical activity, which is plus 20%, which is pretty awesome. I think what's really cool is that we found a way to get those rewards in a very sustainable fashion. We, we never fund those rewards ourselves. We always get those rewards from our partners in exchange for their engagement with our users. And that makes the whole thing uh, very uh, sustainable. So we've grown to 100 million users being a, a, a profitable business. The thing is that if you look at Web3 versus Web2, then the value of a user is substantially, uh, substantially larger. Can be an order of two orders of magnitude higher than that in Web2. So imagine how much more value we can source from the Web3 uh, ecosystem and give back to the user, because that's essentially what we do. Uh, so again, very specific recipe to how to make sure that this next billion come into play and they enjoy the product. Because at the end of the day, the only thing you can do to, for, to, to bring the next billion people into Web3 is to build a product that they love. So you, you want to have a product that's free to use, very low barriers to entry. You want to build an experience that's easy to grasp, and part of it is the technical rails that you want to use. You don't want to you know, make your users suffer creating a wallet for like you know, 20 minutes. And that's how we managed to create 11 million wallets on year because it takes less than 60 seconds to, to build. So, and then, sorry, to, 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 to create a wallet. And then finally, rewarding experience. We have an established sustainable business model Web 2. There's no reason why we can't replicate it on Web 3, albeit with a different type of partners. But we already have a, a bunch of uh, reward partners in place, so that's only get better from, from now on. Um, tokenomics, I think what's important here is that uh, remember, we talked about the free to use. So whenever you ask your user to purchase, to buy your token, you're creating a, uh, a, an adoption barrier. So in our case, 25% of um, our token supply TGE is going to be given as an airdrop, essentially, uh, to, to our existing users in, uh, in a match one-to-one. -one. So you look at your Sweatcoin balance, and if you opted in, you'll get the same number of sweat, which you'll be able then to trade at your, uh, you know, at your pleasure. Um, community is king, but you know it all. Uh, wait. No. Yeah. 
So, I mean, we got to a pretty sizable following from uh, ground zero from uh, April the 12th when we announced the, uh, the launch of uh, Sweat Token. And I think this, I, I particularly like that graph. It just shows the speed of a creation of the first million wallet. So if you look at uh, many other protocols, then it took them a lot of time. Um, Axie took, was the fastest by far. It took them just over two months. We were really fortunate. We created the first million in 11 days and the first two million in the 21 days. And right now, as I said, just about three months after announcement, we are at 11 million wallets. Again, still remains to be seen what kind of quality those users are, how they're going to engage with Web3. But we see our job and our mission as to essentially introducing all the huge number of users into Web3, making their onboarding exciting, rewarding, and very, very fun. So yeah, and as a result of that, people will be moving more, and we'll live in a healthier, wealthier planet. That's it from me, I guess, right? So I have four minutes remaining. Yep, thank you so much. Uh, guys, any questions? Any questions from audience? Um, hi, you mentioned the explosive growth um, on Twitter and Discord mm. in your community. Um, this is great, but do you have any particular tips how that worked out or what you would advise? Maybe there was a key um, thing that you did that made you more successful faster than many other chains yeah. and projects. It's a great one. I mean, I don't think I have a particular recipe there. Like, obviously, that helps when you have a few million or tens of millions of users. And that helps create that following. But having said all this, prior to our announcement on April the 12th, we didn't even have a Twitter account. Uh, we didn't have anything on Discord. We didn't have anything on Telegram. So I think it's just the, it's also timing, because this is when the kind of the consumer products started to take off. Um, and let's face it, I mean, in my life, that's the easiest elevator pitch about your product. Like, you can explain it literally five seconds. So you walk, and we convert your steps into a currency, and that this is how you become healthier. So I guess it's a combination of, of um, a universal appeal, a story that's really easy to tell. You know, obviously having a little bit of that kind of legacy following lots of very active, very passionate users, and then just doing, not, not fucking it up with hiring the right people and just posting the right content. The content is important, yeah, but you know it anyway. Thank you. And I suppose there was one more question. Hi. Um, sorry if I missed this, but if I'm a sweat coin holder, what, mm -hmm. what is the utility of the, the coin as a holder? Yeah. And, and, and a second question is related is, you mentioned that it's a sustainable business model that the sweat coins are being basically funded through your partners. Um, what are the partners getting in return? Yeah, that? that's a great question. So firstly, the existing sweat coin app, and feel free to just go ahead and install it from App Store. Uh, uh, we work with about more than 600 partners. You can uh, exchange your sweat coins for products, services, experiences. You can donate it to charity. So there's quite a lot of utility to sweat coin today. But Sweatcoin of today is nothing more than just an air mile. It's a centralized in-app currency. Now, what's in it for the, um, for the partners? That's a great question because Sweatcoin is illiquid. You can only spend it within Sweatcoin Marketplace. That's one of the drawbacks, actually, the existing currency has. So what partners get, they get an opportunity to get access to our user base. That's in case of brand partners. Or in case of healthcare providers, like the NHS in the UK or health insurers, they have an opportunity to make their particular user segment healthier and more physically active. So, for example, we work with the NHS on the diabetes prevention program. The NHS funds the additional range of products above and beyond on what's available by default to everybody in the UK. And because they fund that particular range of products, Whereas on average our users are 20% more active, the NHS targeted users are 40% more active and they lose about 6% of their body weight in 10, 10 weeks. So that's what's in it for partners. It's either exposure to our user base or an opportunity to make 
those users, specific users, more active. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Oh, seems we're done with the questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, we have two more amazing speakers for today before we go to our happy hours and networking. I uh, just wanted to remind you that we have some activities upstairs. Uh, you have a chance to get some airdrops of near tokens on your wallet. There is some puzzle, some quiz, so don't forget to check it out. upstairs right now we have AC downstairs we have a plenty of places you can grab your iced coffee and join us downstairs just wanted to remind you that you can see the whole list of our speakers on our event bright link uh, there you can find your our YouTube uh, live broadcast link as well. Uh, don't hesitate to share it. And if you're interested in our uh, ecosystem hiring unit, uh, you can find me. I can uh, answer all your questions. doors will be open today till the 7 p.m. so we are planning to have some cocktails right after two speakers I'm happy to present you our next speaker, Sasha Hudzilin, co-creator of Human Guild, with the talk Gaming Ecosystem on Near. Welcome. That feel real funky, Yeah. Cool. Well, sounds good. So we're going to talk today a bit about uh, gaming on Nier uh, and what uh, Human Guild is uh, all about. So we started... Anyway, like, let's go <laughs> next. So uh, I started uh, at Nier from the very beginning, so in August 2018. Most, mostly was focused on business development, talking to Web3 founders in a space. At the time, the space was very small, just 500 uh, founders, less than 500 founders was uh, when we just started in 2018. It was a bear market. Very few people were entering the space, maybe like 30 developers per month. 95% of them were going to Ethereum. It was, in fact, like very challenging times to start new layer one. And I was doing a whole bunch of other things, like fundraisers for startups, uh, content events, and recruiting. And uh, we learned from talking to the founders a uh, couple things that became really uh, important pieces for Nier's own product strategy. So we learned, for, for instance, that it's not about scalability. Uh, for, for blockchains, our initial assumption was that it's all about scalability. When we started talking to blockchain gaming studios, we learned that they actually want to get gamers first. So scalability was actually secondary consideration. Uh, and uh, usability, getting gamers into the game, was very important. They were losing actually 199 people out of 200 on a MetaMask alone. And so Nier kind of developed its own uh, approach to usability through how onboarding is done on, on a browser wallet, how transactions are handled, and how account management system is done, flexible key management, cryptography removed. We learned through this that usability should be a very important focus, not just scalability. 
Um, we started helping a lot of founders on the business side as well. That was a way for us early days to win founders on, on year. So a lot of times we would win founders because of uh, business side of their, biz uh, their uh, business, not because of technology. So oftentimes I would pick near because of the business consideration. And then I also started the first incubator uh, on near called Open Web Collective. It's run by Mimi now. It's done three batches of acceleration, uh, about to start the fourth fourth batch. Now we have multiple accelerators in ecosystem, so that's super exciting. And then I started uh, Human Guild as a first spin-off from Nier in 2021. Since then, we had a lot more spin-offs, such as Proximity, Aurora, many others. Uh, initial focus for us was on earners in Nier ecosystem. We believe that the more earners you get, uh, the faster you build sustainable economy uh, of human activity on top of, uh, on top of blockchain. And then we started focusing more and more on gaming because we saw that creators, mostly on NFT marketplace called Paras on Nier, had interest in building games. Oftentimes they didn't have skill sets, but they were interested in building games. And so we started doing game jams, YouTube cross promotions, and started inviting more uh, game, game developers and gaming founders into Nier ecosystem. And through that kind of became go-to team for, for gaming on Nier, supporting founders through this, working on scales. So two games today in the world have uh, concurrent users of like not concurrent, overall users of a billion. 34 games today in the world have 100 million users, uh, gamers. When it comes to Web3 gaming, it's still very early. So there are three games that are above 100,000 uh, uh, weekly active wallets. Those are Alien Worlds, Splinterlands, and Farmer's World. Um, and there was a lot of money invested in gaming as of recently. Uh, earlier this year was 5 billion invested in gaming in the first half of 2022. And another important piece to mention, 52% of all of the Web3 activity today is happening uh, in games. Uh, but it's, so it's still early when it comes to active uh, wallets relatively to overall gaming. Obviously, it's many orders of magnitude difference still. Um, but at the same time, it's a big chunk of Web3 activity today. And that's overall uh, Web3 gaming. It's not near gaming. Now for near... Um, for, for near ecosystem overall, so uh, as, as people probably know here, I, I don't want to spend too much time on uh, near stats, but we have 700 or so projects uh, b being built on near. You can check out awesome near to kind of see them. We have 10,000 daily active wallets, 50,000 weekly active wallets on near. Most of the usage today coming through D5, uh, through Aurora ecosystem, through NFT marketplaces like Paras and through Near Crowd, some of the new use cases, gig economy, uh, similar to Mechanical Turk. When it comes to gaming, so overall we have 88 games being developed. We're working with 50 of them or so. Uh, only few of them are on mainnet. There are five that went live, with one of them being in the top 10 uh, most active contracts today on Near called Zomland. And if you want to give a try to kind of see what is the representative example of the game on Nier. I encourage you to go to try Crypto Hero. So if you go to Google and search for Pixel Dapps, you're going to see uh, their website, and you can like check it out. It's a really cool dungeon scroller. When they launched, uh, 10,000 gamers were playing it in the beginning. That was in, uh, in January. But since then, activity kind of tapered off a bit. So retention is still kind of clacking for the time being when it comes to uh, gaming ecosystem on Nier, and the biggest data point so far for us, it was this Crypto Hero. 10,000 uh, people were playing it uh, at the beginning. So when we work uh, with founders, we uh, tend to um, emphasize on information sharing. So we tell founders that they're not competing with each other. They should not treat anything they're building as a secret sauce, such as like don't treat your token economics or anything like this, um, like secret sauce, and approach it like near approach it early days when it comes to layer ones and layer twos when they were getting started. We had a YouTube uh, uh, series called Whiteboard Series, where there was a lot of cross-collaboration in terms of how uh, scalability is done uh, in, in blockchain. When it comes to R&D, this early days, we borrowed some ideas from Polkadot. Ethereum 2 borrowed some ideas from Nier. It was a lot of cross-collaboration. And so similarly, when it comes to gaming founders, we're trying to encourage the same kind of uh, cross-collaboration and sharing culture, as opposed to trying to hold back and, and think like, like people competing. Of course, they're going to be competing once the game's launched, but for now, there is a lot of uh, learnings that needs to happen until then. We, we also focus quite a bit on independent game developers. Independent game developers usually are more creative ones, and they're also uh, more frugal, so they can do a lot more um, on a cheaper budget, and they can also launch much faster. So a typical independent game can launch on year within like three to six months, but then if you're building something more complex, it can take a year or two. And 
uh, obviously need budget for this. So we focus on independent game developers even more so, given the current market conditions. And also we emphasize user-generated content. So it, it appears a lot in virtual worlds, user-generated content, and appears in some games. But it's actually a key to increasing amount of earners, which I was saying earlier is important for sustainable economy. Uh, it's also important uh, to solve retention problem, because if you build just purely your own IP as a game developer, uh, you might have this problem where people will leave the game after they get bored, right? And if, on the other hand, you use user-generated content as a part of your game, then it can be more sustainable. People can be uh, playing it for much longer. And also, by the way, you can solve moderation for, uh, for um, user-generated content through near-crowd style gigs. So that's also possible. So we encourage more of that. We have maybe five, six uh, games in the virtual worlds today focusing on user-generated content. We recently did Game Jam that was just focusing on user-generated content, and we're going to do more uh, on that front. And so we usually start with a grant, but we mostly help with non-monetarily uh, other pieces. We believe that money doesn't really lead to like success. It's like important, but it's not the prerequisite for success. And so we focus on fun gameplays, how to make a compelling game, game, how to do go to market in a Web3 native way, how to do it incrementally and with the community. We focus on building sustainable economies and how they t tie back to gaming mechanics and also recruiting in Web3, legal, community building. So those are the kind of components of success that, that people need. And here is the more exciting part of the presentation. I'm going to show the video uh, that will show some of the games being developed. Uh, let me just figure out how to pull up the video. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. 
example, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll finish with a couple uh, small pieces here. So market conditions uh, changed quite a bit, as you might know. So potential global recession uh, decreases capital availability. I personally think that we're going to be in this market conditions for a while, for a couple of years, actually. Um, so access to capital converges around experienced teams. So what we're seeing is that people who've built successful Web2 games uh, they tend to converge all of the capital uh, when it comes to like venture capital being available for games and then first time creators actually uh, struggle through this uh, because also from the investor perspective uh, there is a lot of like rookie mistakes avoidable mistakes that can happen if you haven't built games so for example you spend a lot of time on game engine or maybe not do something uh, with uh, your art pipeline uh, correctly and can blow through money easily so that's what we're seeing so access to capital converges around experienced teams uh, founders in this market environment need to conserve cash. We, we saw quite a few uh, of teams who decreased monthly burn dramatically already in response to the uh, change in market conditions. Uh, founders need to focus. That's another important consideration. In a bull market, uh, often we, we saw people doing three, four things uh, at once, and now it's impossible to do. Um, and launching as quickly as possible, not trying to uh, time the market, being very iterative with the, with the game and, and launching and iterating with your users is what's important. Um, and then finding users in organic way is another important piece. NFT drops is a way to do that. Um, we've seen more teams kind of like converging towards NFT drops. We found finally the team to do NFT breach, which is very important for uh, some of this. Um, and so that, that's kind of like the advice. Now, if you want to work with us, so follow uh, us on Twitter. Human Guild, Alexander, uh, we give uh, grants still, although we became a bit more conservative like everyone else in this uh, market. Uh, ping us on Telegram, Discord, or Twitter uh, if you want to kind of like engage deeper and build something together with us. Uh, find this guy on Telegram and myself on Twitter. Uh, we also have Discord, so humanguild.io has a link to Discord. And once you chat to our DAO members, we can add you to the founder group and you can start engaging with other founders as well and learning from each other. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha. <laughs> Guys, any questions to Sasha? Uh, if we have no questions right now, I'm so sure that Sasha will stay with us for the happy hour and you can ask your questions in person. Uh, I just want to ask uh, our next speaker, James Sinka, uh, to go to our organization team, which is right behind the stage. James Sinka, please. Uh, our organization team waiting for you right behind the stage. just need a few moments uh, before our final pitch today. Uh, we will close with a really great presentation, our speaker's hours, and we will be ready to move on to our happy hours. Guys, you have a chance to join us, join SERP for our final presentation today and take a part in our Q&A session right before the happy hours. Just wanted to remind you that today is Best Free Community Day, so we expect to have uh, great conversations today. And I'm happy to present us uh, uh, our final pitch for today. James Sinka, Core Builder, Orange DAO, and Don Ho, GP, Orange DAO Fund, with the talk Building Orange DAO. Welcome. And we also have YouTube live broadcasting. Ooh. Hello. Hey, everyone. Um, as you can see, I am not Don Ho, <laughs> but I'm substituting for him today. I'm Brian. 
I work on the Orange Dow Fun team. Yep, and my name is James. Uh, I'm working inside Orange Dow doing DSI investments and helping to build the Orange Fellowship, which I'm excited to talk to you guys about today. Awesome. Well, we're super excited to be about Orange Dow. So we are a community of over 1,300 founders, um, and we are primarily a venture Dow, even though we're working in a lot of different areas. And we're super excited to be partnered with Near as one of our Layer One partners. So. Orange Fund is a venture fund, and we back early stage companies um, and provide them with everything that an early stage founder needs to get from zero to one. We have an amazing community of founders that can help you with absolutely everything you need, whether that's partnerships, whether that's product feedback, whether you're going through a rough time as a founder. We understand all of that and are able to support you in ways that very few other investors are able to. Um, on the Orange Fund side of things, we've been investing very, very actively in the venture space, in Web3, and we haven't slowed down. <laughs> Even though there's a bear market, we're super excited about everyone who's building right now, and we're really excited to support companies and teams that are building on top of Near. We are able to, we, do, we have a pretty fast investment process, um, and really support you from helping you with partnerships within our portfolio companies to everything that you could possibly need from a founder. Brian, could you tell us how long it takes from when someone gets excited about learning about Orange Dow to applying and actually getting that check? Yeah, so we, we try to move pretty quickly right now, um, and we've gotten our process down to a little over two weeks. Uh, we are Dow, so a little bit slower than other organizations, but the great thing is every time someone applies to us, they know that they're getting the best expert eyes on their product and the best people to be evaluating their product possible. So like as an example, uh, my background is in chemistry and material sciences. So any time that we get a Web3 project that's working in the science space, there's a lot of biotech DAOs that are out there, longevity DAOs, some material science DAOs, uh, lab DAOs a great example. I can actually give them support based on my experience as being a scientist. And similarly, since we have over a thousand Y Combinator founders, you get partnered with folks that have actually had experience in the domains that you're building in, um, whether that's you know, go-to-market strategy, uh, B2B corporate sales, which a lot of folks haven't done, um, whether it's, it's even just like growth hacking. Like for, for the longest time, I didn't know how to build a funnel to get users that would land on our website, actually convert and use our product. And it, this might sound like simple things, um, but through the vast experiences of YC founders in our network, you can get hands-on support for people who are experts at each part of that stack that'll help you go zero to one. Exactly, our founders have gone through everything. They've built small companies, they've built large companies, they've had exits, they've changed the world. And we're gonna to continue to do that within our ecosystem. We like to say that we're building more than just a venture down, we're building a digital nation here. Um, and that really means everything. Like we have the best builders in the space possible. We will support you everything that you need to get from zero to one. And so anyone who's building on Near or in the Near ecosystem right now, come talk to us, come apply to us. Um, we'd love to chat with you. And we're looking at some of the most exciting spaces possible, one of those being DSI. DSI, yes, yes, yes. So for those that have never heard of DSI before, uh, DSI is Decentralized Science. And we take the, the acronym from DeFi, like Decentralized Finance. And the, the whole vision of DSI is to take all the tooling that is Web3 native, that's default open access, that's interoperable, and bring those, those concepts, those innovations to the realm of science. So if any of you all have paid taxes before, you may know that your tax money has gone in to actually fund scientific research. So whether that's like Alzheimer's or cancer or what have you. And the irony there is your tax dollars go to pay a researcher to do the work at whatever school they're at, and then once they actually have a publication, something that they're ready to show the world, they have to take some of that money that they got from a grant and actually pay the publisher to post their research, right? Which is kind of backwards. But what gets even worse is once that research has been published, you know, in Nature, Cell, what have you, you now, as the, the consumer of that research, as like a normal person, you have to pay to access that research. You might have to pay $50 to find a PDF that explains, you know, what the experiments were, what the results were, how this might be useful. And that is completely backwards. If you think about it, science is like one of the original public goods that we had as a species, right? Learning how to cook food and make fire and build homes. Like, science and technology is what allows us to be here in the present space. So it doesn't make sense that you'd have to pay to access the knowledge that as a species we've been able to grow and create. And the beauty of Web3 is everything is open access by default. So anything that you publish on chain is default viewable by everyone anywhere in the world. And so instead of gatekeeping knowledge for those folks that just have the privilege to be able to afford it, we now can build primitives that by default, anyone anywhere can access from and contribute to. 
And so you can imagine that we, we at some point, will have a, a Wikipedia-style tree of knowledge that'll archive from the moment research comes out of university, um, all of the data points and all of the experiments that were conducted, so that way anywhere, anyone can look at those root-based data points and build up from there the same conclusions that the scientists have. And this might sound like just a small little feature set, but the, the way science works these days is, you know, a researcher out of Harvard or MIT, let, let's take COVID as an example. They'll say, great, we've shown that the COVID vaccines are efficacious. And, you know, they'll demonstrate what context they were in, how they ran the experiment. Uh, and depending on, on um, what the media wants to show, they might sensationalize it one way or another. They might say COVID is, vaccines are 100% effective, or like, oh, there's a very small place where it's not effective, so that must mean that they're useless completely. And those headlines become publicized, and then they get retweeted, and they grow these massive uh, clouts that are actually one layer removed from the base science. And once those kind of pick up their own wildfire, uh, they make their way to legislators who actually legislate uh, now two layers away, removed from the science that was originally published. But if science is default on chain and it's open access, anyone can go back to the root data and graph those conclusions themselves. And so there's no longer um, a marriage of the scientific data with the story that it tells. We can remove the spin, we can remove the media axis that wants to take these things and sensationalize them and all go back to the root data set, that root cause that we can understand. Um, I think DSI has the opportunity to just change the way that we collaborate and, and create innovations that truly do belong to us all, right? Originally, DSI has, has come from our tax money, and at the end of the day, belongs to us to get you know, better phones, uh, clean energy, and just really increase the, the quality of life for everyone. Um, so we at Orange Dow have made a number of DSI investments. Uh, I'm excited to continue building in the space. So if any of you all are you know, teaming at the bit like I am to build an open access default uh, open DSI, come find me. Uh, my name is James, and you can find me, James Sinka, on Twitter, uh, jamesinka.com, the whole nine yards. So James, could you yes. tell us about some of the projects in DSI that yes. you're really excited about right Yes, now? yes, yes. Okay, so a little bit of bias here. All right, again, like I mentioned, Orange Dow has invested in the space, so some of these are portfolio companies. Um, but one of my favorite projects is uh, a project called Lab Dow. And these guys are building a Web3 primitive to allow any scientist anywhere in the world to post uh, a standard operating procedure. And so that might look like a recipe that you would have for any kind of like a bread, like a banana bread that you might make. And you can post them in a way that is um, native or they're creating new primitives. So any lab anywhere can take this recipe book, the standard operating procedure, and execute on it and then give you back the results. And this, this might sound kind of trivial, but you can imagine there's more scientists out in the world that have ideas of what kind of experiments they could run than can afford the multi-million dollar equipments that it takes to actually run these experiments. And so finally, we can decouple um, access to hardware and capital from scientific breakthrough from, from a, a concept idea. And th this ability to allow anyone anywhere to sort of run experiments without having to put the upfront costs will allow us to um, bring more people into the fold from places that you know, don't live at like a Boston and have access to an MIT, or that live in San Francisco or can go to a, um, a Stanford. Um, so uh, LabDAO is one of my favorites. Another favorite of mine is uh, Molecule. So it's molecule.to. They've invented the IP NFT framework. So you can take your intellectual property that you've created in your lab and actually mint it as an NFT. And you might think, like, OK, like, why are we doing this? But it, it turns out that um, intellectual property is a very illiquid, very non-transparent market. And so if you have, as, as myself, I've got a patent, uh, but it's not actually useful because no one knows it exists. But finally, we can build marketplaces entirely dedicated to people finding uh, new, innovative ways to do certain things. In my, in my example, I've got a, a cold brew patent that makes cold brew in 30 minutes instead of 24 hours. So if you were interested in, in coffee, you could look through what's all the innovation that's been happening in the coffee space. And then with a click of a few buttons, just like you would buy an NFT on OpenSea, you could immediately have the rights to use the research that I've created. And so bringing that liquidity in also allows you to program uh, the way people get revenue back from that IP NFT. So you can imagine, if I have an idea to build a teleporter, right? Sounds like a crazy idea, but I was able to convince a bunch of my friends that, listen, I've got it, I figured it out, we're going to build a teleporter. I could crowdfund, crowdfund from a bunch of different folks, 
in exchange for ownership, a part of the actual licensing revenue from the future existing IP NFT, so that when it gets minted, uh, right then and there, Brian, you might own 1% of it. Someone else in the crowd might own another percent. And so that way, when you know, the military comes by and they're like, we want your teleporter, it's like, great, okay, here you can have the IP NFT, and immediately outflow will bring back revenue to everyone that's contributed in the beginning. But the thing that's the most important about this primitive is that scientists can finally get rewarded as early as possible for their breakthrough ideas if it has use in the market. And so you can imagine someone might create a version one of their technology, license it out, and then immediately that money comes back for them to do research on the version two that can then get published, licensed out, and come back and make version three. And there's no one better to, to know how to allocate that capital than the person who's invented that breakthrough to begin with. So, DeSci is creating primitives to allow the people who are best to allocate that capital to be in the ownership seat of that money. And the last example I'll give you guys is a company called Vibe Bio. So Vibe Bio is creating communities for patients that have rare genetic diseases, uh, where there's only maybe 50 people globally that have this rare genetic disease. So there's an A where there should be a T in your genetic code. And these rare genetic diseases, because there's so few people, their TAMs are too small for a traditional biotech company to go in and actually do the research to find a cure, because their TAM might only be you know, 10 million, 50 million dollars, right? So you, you can't actually go through the full cycle to get your money back and make profit. But now, we can let patients crowdsource or crowdfund uh, with groups to get 100K, 200K, 500K, and hire a private investigator to look at them and give the folks that all have the same rare genetic disease personalized treatment. So at the base case, you now have folks who would never have access to uh, help from a doctor to actually get privatized research that'll help them at least learn, maybe you know, taking a hot shower might help you with some of your symptoms, right? In an ideal case, you'd actually be able to find some kind of a, a drug or a therapeutic that will help you alleviate whatever issues that you have. And in the moonshot case, these groups might actually be able to crowdfund an entirely new class of drugs that will not only help the folks that have the rare genetic disease, but can help other people that are suffering from similar ailments. And in the case of, of those patients, they'll actually end up making a ton of money from hiring a small group of, of researchers to help them with their issue, and those folks are gonna have the most empathy to take that money and reinvest it in the future of research as opposed to just banking it and buying yachts. Right, so we're again, we're able to, with DSI, align incentives and help bring new markets to life that otherwise, with traditional finance, wouldn't be able to be supported. So hopefully, as you can see by what James is talking about, we are visionaries at Orange Cloud. <laughs> we believe in the future and what Web3 and blockchain technologies are going to be able to do for us. We're optimistic that ReFi can help yes. save the planet. Yes. We're optimistic that DSI can solve our biggest scientific problems. We believe consumer data can be fixed mm. with blockchain technologies. Um, so if you're building something crazy, come talk to us. <laughs> uh, we're super excited to be partnered with Nier. And yes. You know, we're, we're one of the pathways that's going to help you get from zero to one fastest. So when you're ready to change the world, come work with us, and we'd be excited to talk to you and help you change the world together with us. Yeah, and that's uh, orangedow.xyz for all of you guys that aren't in the know. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you for such an amazing final presentation. It was a pleasure. Uh, do you have any questions to our speakers? Just raise your hand, yell it out. Nice. What's up? So how much did you invest already and in how many different projects or companies? Uh, so I want to say, go for it, please. So we backed uh, 95 companies in the last um, little under a year, yeah. seven or eight months at this point in time. Um, we don't have a particular area, so we do make early stage bets. So we're really betting on founders who we believe will come to the right answer and make a positive impact on the world. So we look at everything from healthcare to DSI to refi to consumer. Um, there's, there's no particular area. As long as you're leveraging blockchain and Web3 technologies, following these kinds of community ownership models, and really going for an aggressive idea and aggressive vision, yeah. we'll be the team to be behind you. And our average check size is six figures, so 100K. Thank you. Any other questions? Seems no. You can every, like every time to ask your questions uh, in person as we have happy hours upstairs. Awesome. So thank you guys once again. Thank, thank you. you. So uh, I think it's time to move on to our networking and happy hours that uh,
start in just in a few minutes upstairs. Thank you so much for everyone who've been with us on YouTube. Uh, stay tuned with our social media of Near UA. We are posting all our upcoming events there. Uh, just wanted to remind you that today is the final day of uh, Near Space, powered by Near UA. Uh, just want to say thank you our organization team who's uh, hosting us for these three days. It was really amazing. And uh, let's move on to our happy hours. See you all at the bar.